So I want to talk about the gay rights issue today. And what I specifically want to do is take their arguments, which I think a lot of people are intimidated by, including Christians, and arguments that have deceived hundreds of millions of people and show you how wrong those arguments are. And in doing this, I'm going to assume today that you all accept what the Bible says, even though there might be some who don't, that you're clear as to what it says from cover to cover. The Bible doesn't say that this is anything but a sin. It doesn't say that it's an immutable character trait that nobody can change. It doesn't say it's biologically caused. And it says that people can change. And if you don't agree with that, we're not going to spend time on that. I'm just assuming that because I want to speak to the Christians and show them uh, to believe the Word of God that we can trust it despite what might appear to be insurmountable arguments that are being given today on the other side of this issue. We've received, a, we've received a one-sided propaganda campaign on this issue for decades now, where you only hear one side of the issue in all of the media, whether it's entertainment media or news media. And one thing that annoys me is that if you think you're going to get relief from Fox News, which is the conservative news network, don't hold your breath because half the people on that station are in favor of gay marriage and so forth. So you can't ever hear the other side of the argument. And what's frustrating about that is we hold all the cards. If you know what the arguments are, we hold all the cards and they have none. And I hope to convince you of that this morning. Now this whole cause, the gay rights movement, to me is transparently preposterous. So I want to tell you what my basic perspective is. It's this. The idea that a behavior this out of line with what nature indicates is the proper use of the body part, a behavior that's this far out of line with what is healthy, safe behavior, and what nature indicates is the proper use of the body, and is this unhealthy, can't possibly have a valid reason for supporting the normalization of the behavior. In other words, you have a behavior that's this aberrant. How can any real argument be provided that we ought to normalize a behavior like that? And so whatever seems to be an argument that's an insurmountable argument that the other side is given, if you scratch it, it has to be shot to a hole. <coughs> and that's, in fact, what we find to be true. Not only that, but this morning, you won't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm not going to use any arguments based on tradition <coughs> or religion. I'm not going to use any arguments based on tradition. You know, you hear arguments like, well, civilizations and intelligent people for thousands of years have not accepted this behavior as normal. I find that a stupid, unconvincing argument. For thousands of years, people worship the moon. Should we have continued worshiping the moon? An argument based on tradition is worthless, and yet that's often the only argument you hear. Oh, I grew up believing this and things like that, and that's the reason that I believe in you know, the traditional marriage. That's not a good argument. I'm not going to use an argument based on religion because only religious people would believe that. Okay? If you already accept the Bible, you probably know what to think about this issue, and I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in showing you What's biblical, I'm assuming you already know that. <coughs> I want to give you reasons why it's irrational to believe the arguments of the gay rights movement. So, take your Bible this morning, and even though this is based on this Bible, just take it and throw it out the door. Did you ever hear, did you ever hear a preacher say that? It's not because we don't believe it, aren't committed to it, don't believe it's the inerrant word of God if you were born again Christian here this morning. But it's because I want to show you arguments that can destroy even what an atheist believes. And I'm going to give you arguments that an atheist cannot argue against and will have to accept, including the conclusion to what we're going to say today. And I would say this, every reasonable atheist would go along with the conclusion, if reasonable atheist isn't a contradiction in terms. <laughs> We're going to play.
play ball with their ball. And I'll tell you this, the basic thing I'm going to say is in here. Because Romans 1 says that homosexuality is against nature. So if we argue from nature, even an atheist has to agree that nature exists and that it dictates to us in a way that we cannot contradict it, contradict it what is natural and what isn't natural. Does that make sense? Nature tells you what's, it's an objective measuring stick to tell us what is natural, normal, and what is abnormal and unnatural. And so because even an atheist has to accept that, and the Bible says it's against nature, we ought to be able to fashion arguments that even convince an atheist. Now, I think it's really important to get a good perspective before we start. So I'm not going to jump into the arguments right now. The media has misrepresented what we think about this issue. <clears throat> For example, no one should hate homosexuals. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and hate anybody. And most Christians do not hate homosexuals. No rational person would want to harm, harass, hurt, or hate anyone. And Christians don't hate homosexuals. And if I seem angry or I start to rant and foam at the mouth here today, it's not because I am angry at homosexual. I am not. I don't think of a homosexual as different than any other person who's a sinner just like me, who needs Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ died on the cross for that person. God loves him. The Bible says that God so loved the world that Jesus is the propitiation, he's the sacrifice, not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world, and that includes homosexuals. He doesn't approve of the behavior any more than he approves of the behavior of a bank robber, but he loves them all and wants to see them all saved, has saved many homosexuals in the past and changed their lifestyle around radically. 1 Corinthians 6 says, such were some of you. And there's a list of some of the things the Corinthians were, including homosexuals, is in that list, and he says, but you were saved and you were changed and washed and cleansed. And they were changed around. And one thing the media doesn't, uh, always misrepresents is how many homosexuals have been permanently changed into a heterosexual lifestyle. They're trying to tell you that's immutable, unchangeable, and nobody can change. That's not true. In matter of fact, I was listening to a tape this week from John MacArthur's uh, school, one of their chapters, chapels. And this speaker said he, he looked at the, uh, this particular issue, and there were 30 studies done, 30 of them, mostly by secular groups. And the success rate for people who had hung in there for a long time, who had hung in there and not reverted back to their homosexual lifestyle for at least five years, so it's a long term. It wasn't somebody who starts and then they quit after a month. The success rate at that point is 80. Two percent. They don't go back into the homosexual lifestyle yeah. because it's not immutable. <clears throat> it's a habit that can be changed like any other habit. And the reason some people think that they can't change that habit is because any habit is hard to overcome and you have a continual level of all different responses. Some who very successfully get over any habit and some who don't. But that doesn't mean it's biological because some find it hard. God loves the homosexual unconditionally, wants them saved, wants them sanctified. And one more thing before we get into their arguments, and that's this, by way of a right perspective. The Westboro Baptist Church, do you know who that is? Those are the guys that go to the funerals of soldiers who have died, protest against them, not because the soldier was gay. They don't care whether he was gay or not but because they have this theology, this wrong theology that says if the society is general, generally permissive about homosexuality then, and God hates the homosexual, then God kills the soldiers of that country. And that's what they're out there protesting. The Westboro Baptist, you might have seen them on TV, they even went to the Supreme Court and had a decision. So that's how much they've been in the news. The Westboro Baptist Church does not represent Christianity. 
They do not even represent what it means to be a Baptist. They do not represent God. They do not represent what the Bible says at all. And if they were here today, and I think it's a very small church, it might fit in this room, I would give them two things. I would, first of all, take everyone over my knee and give them a spank. <laughs> and the second thing I would give them is a theology lesson. Because what passage of scripture will you exegete that says God hates the homosexual? And what passage of scripture would you, would you exegete that says God kills the soldiers of a country that sort of has a permissive attitude about homosexuality? You're not going to be able to find that. That's poor theology and it doesn't represent what the Bible says. Now, let's talk about the arguments that are used by the gay rights movement. And I want to show you that we hold all the cards. In fact, I think by the time we're done today, and I think I'm only going to get to the first argument and finish it. <laughs> Seriously. But by the time we're done, you're going to see the gay rights movement has no justification for its existence whatsoever. The first argument that they use is an argument that is central to their position. It has deceived, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, it might be understating it, hundreds of millions of people across the world. This argument is an argument that a lot of people are intimidated into, I think this is true, I, this is a guess on my part, I think this is true, that there are millions of people who don't want to hold to the position of the gay rights movement, but because this seems so convincing to them, they reluctantly hold on to this argument and reluctantly go along with the gay rights movement and are uncomfortable there. And if they heard one single argument that seemed even equal to that argument, they would switch horses in midstream. I think a lot of people are really uncomfortable, but they've been intimidated in the one-sided propaganda campaign to go along with it, and they've never heard a good argument on the other side. We're going to destroy this one argument. This argument is the tent pole that holds up the tent of the gay rights movement. It's held up by one tent pole. If you can swipe that tent pole away, the whole tent comes crashing down. If you can take this argument away, and we'll, you'll understand this by the end of the message. If you can take this one argument away, the entire gay rights movement folds. <coughs> but it's the most deceptive argument, and let me say this. It's easy to destroy this argument, and we're going to destroy it today. What is this argument that's so persuasive? Let me put argument number one up here, although that's a far <coughs> be further than this. Okay. Their first argument, let's call it the argument from the biological origin of homosexuality. I want to state this argument stronger than you've even heard it ever stated by the gay rights people themselves. To show you that no matter how much rope we give them, it's still easy to shatter this. This is a simple argument to shatter, and I wonder why nobody has ever bothered to argue against it. So simple to shatter. But let me first state it the way they would be really pleased that I stated it in front of you right now. Because I want to express this argument in a way that usually they don't state it themselves this strong. So let me try anyway. 